Um, I wanted to just talk briefly about Father's Day and then get into the gospel, hopefully. Uh, Father's Day is the American commemoration that occurs the third Sunday of June each year. Why? Its original intent was to establish a more intimate relationship between fathers and their children. Um, and to really impress on the fathers the full measure of their obligations, of their responsibilities. And so, as we reflect on Father's Day, we understand that there is no more intimate relationship between a father and a son than between God the Father and His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior. So as we celebrate Father's Day today, I, I ask that we all contemplate on God and Father. First of all, I want us to think of the model prayer for Christians, right? the one that our Lord Jesus Christ himself taught us. He said, therefore, pray in this manner, our Father who art in heaven. The main point is that God the Father is not just a father to our Lord Jesus Christ, but to, to us as well. He's our Father too. And that intimate relationship between God and Jesus can be the nature of our relationship between God the Father as well. So that relationship was broken and it was damaged when, um, when Adam and Eve sinned. And we ourselves have done plenty to, to continue the problem with our own sins and our own passion. Thankfully, our Lord Jesus Christ came and restored that relationship through his passion, his resurrection, and his glorious ascension. And, you know, as we reflect on Father's Day, and we reflect on the gospel today, actually, there's kind of a nice connection. We adults, and I say that generally, we adults, and dads specifically, are called to be like the four friends in the, in the gospel today. We're called to bring our children and our grandchildren and our godchildren to our Lord Jesus Christ. We're called to teach them and to show them how to come to Jesus in prayer, in reading scripture, in participating in worship, in receiving the Eucharist, in confession, in forgiving others, in helping others, especially those who are less fortunate. Hopefully we can bring our children to Christ, not because we're you know, employees of Christ, but because we are lovers of God, right? Because we want our children to continue to be lovers of God. You know, the large, the large crowds and, and the walls surrounding Jesus did not prevent the four friends from finding a way to, to make uh, or to get the paralytic to Jesus. Neither should we, adults, let any obstacle prevent us from bringing our children to Jesus. We have to find a way. And so I want to go a little bit deeper into the gospel today to find some insight of how we can apply it to ourselves as we celebrate Father's Day. And it goes to all adults as well, not just the dads in the room. Um, in this passage from Luke chapter 5, verses 17 to 26, in this passage it says that these men bring the paralytic on a mat, lower him down, you know, and it, here's what it doesn't say. It doesn't say, and you could read this three different times in three different gospel passages. In the three different gospels, here's what it does not say. It does not say that Jesus saw this man's faith and he healed them. You can read it three different times in three different gospel passages. You will not find it anywhere. What it says is Jesus seeing their faith. He didn't heal them because of his faith, the paralytic's faith. He healed them because of their faith, the faith of the community, the faith of the group, the faith of his friends that brought him there. You know, and you can say, well, I can see healing somebody and on somebody else's faith. We've done that before, right? We, we've read that in the scripture. Didn't the centurion, didn't he have faith in Jesus? And because of that, Jesus healed his servant. So somebody was healed because somebody else had faith. Okay, we can buy that. We, can, we understand that. We have different contexts to compare that. But in this case, telling him to take up his bed and walk is not the first thing that he does. He doesn't heal him directly first, like the centurion. If we look at the text, it says in verse 20, When he saw their faith, he said to him, 
man, your sins are forgiven you. He didn't talk about being a paralytic at all. He says, your sins are forgiven you. Seeing their faith, that was his response. Seeing their faith, he forgave this man's sins. We're talking about salvation. We're talking about your sins being forgiven by God because he saw their faith. And this really blows me away every time that we really contemplate on, on what we're reading. You know, that he is forgiving sins on the basis of multiple people having faith for him. And that's so powerful. Now, how important do you think it is for you to pray for your children? How important is it for you to pray for your spouse, for your neighbor, for your co-workers, for your enemies? It's so tempting in this culture to have a, a one-on-one -on -one view of me and Jesus. You know, it's just me and God. Not to have to deal with these other people. Not to have to deal with the people that live next door to us. Or the people that in fact live in my house. Or the people that go to my church. Just the responsibility of it all. As long as it's just me and Jesus, I can handle that. I only have one person to ultimately worry about. As long as it's separated that way, just between me and God, right? Me and Jesus, we can just have our own thing, right? One on one. And you know, you can't really blame me if my if my daughter or if my son or if my children, if my coworkers, if my neighbor is not healed. You can't really blame me. You can't blame me if they're not forgiven. You can't blame me if they don't have faith. But you see, in the Orthodox Church, in the Orthodox teachings, the teachings of this specific passage, Scripture says we're all in this together. And it goes two ways. It goes both ways. If other people and their faith have a role in whether I myself am forgiven, whether I myself am healed, then it means that it goes the other direction as well as too. It means that I bear a personal responsibility for other people. I bear a personal responsibility for their faith, for their healing, for their forgiveness. And it's a heavy burden. Something else to consider maybe is what, what sorts of sins was he forgiven of? We don't know exactly, but we can guess. Because, you know, we're all human and because most of us commit a lot of the same types of sins. Our Lord told this man that he was forgiven of his sins. So who did he sin against? Those who are the most closest to us, usually. We sin against God. We sin against our spouse. We sin against our children. We sin against our parents, to our neighbors, to those who are closest to us. Those are the ones who you hurt, that I hurt, with our sins. In other words, we bear, we each one of us bears, not all, but we all bear some responsibility for the sins of our brother and our sister, or that of the person who lives next door to us, or the person that lives in our own house, or the person that goes to church with us. And we have to wonder... You know, if there's conflict in the house or if there's conflict around us, and we're like, why hasn't that person gone over that thing yet? How come they're not over it yet? We wonder why that person hasn't repented of their sin or reconciled with you on that specific issue. Is some of that responsibility yours rather than theirs? We have to ask ourselves, how often do I pray for them? How often do I lift them to Christ? How often do I physically take them to Christ? You know, all of us in this room and virtually, all of us are in this together. Each one of us is the paralytic. We are all in need of each other to lift each other up to Christ. Each one of us, I myself included, Abuna David included. And at the same time, each one of us is a friend to the paralytic. Not only are we the paralytic, but we're the friend of the paralytic as well. 
We can't expect our brothers and our sisters and our children to be forgiven of their sins and to be healed of their illnesses unless you yourself are willing to get up and to carry them on the mat all the way to our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, as we contemplate on the Holy Spirit, right, the theme of this month is, is the Holy Spirit after the Pentecost. How is this all related? Have you ever heard St. Paul say, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God? I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. Do you? Let's read it clearly in, from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. It says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, let all wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, be tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ is forgiven you. It says in verse 31, let all bitterness, wrath, and anger, and clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you. What is bitterness? Bitterness is not something that you initiate. Bitterness is purely a sinful response to something bad that somebody has done to you. You might say, I always initiate kindness and love to my brothers and sisters. No, bitterness has nothing to do with that. Bitterness is your brother or your sister has sinned against you and hurt you and did something that just by reflex made you mad. Bitterness grabs on hold on that and says, I have the right to put up a wall between us. I have a right to not want to have anything to do with you. And maybe even just to be short with you. And basically to cut off the relationship emotionally from you. Not because I initiated anything bad on you, but because I'm responding in bitterness because of the evil that you initiated on me. To give up bitterness means that you have to give up the right to hold on to the grudge against anybody that sins against you. That boss that hurt you. That spouse that hurt you. That parent, that child that hurt you? If you have the right to hold a grudge, to have a grudge, to harbor negative feelings in your heart towards that person and to be bitter towards that person, then you grieve the Spirit of God. Anyone can initiate niceness to people all the time and people usually respond in niceness towards those who are nice to them. It takes a Christian to respond with an open heart of love to those who attack you and even hurt you and fail to appreciate you. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger... What is wrath? What is wrath? It's similar to bitterness. It's the sort of anger that you respond to when somebody else hurts you. They did this thing, they did this bad thing to me and they hurt me and I'm upset because they did this thing to me. They shouldn't have done this to me. And we just get we just get angry. This is wrath. You get past all logic. You get past all thinking until you finally got to the point where you just want to hurt them. This is wrath. Again, you're not initiating evil. No, you're responding to the wickedness that someone has done to you. You respond in wrath. You respond in that way. When we do that, we grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Because again, anyone can be nice to everybody. And people respond being nice back to those who are nice to them. But it takes a Christian to respond with love and compassion and mercy to those who hurt us and refuse to repent of it. Evil speaking, malice, all this type of stuff is to be put away from us. If you're going to be a Christian, this has to be put away from us. And that means when people try to hurt you, when people try to disrespect you, when people don't appreciate you, when people try to kill you and nail you to a cross, your response is, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. 
When somebody attacks you verbally, do you attack back? Or do you remain silent? And in your heart, you attack them with your thoughts. Or do you respond with mercy and compassion? Do you say, Father, forgive them. Father, please help them. Father, they're lost. They're confused. Please help them. Don't let your anger or your malice or your bitterness rise when people hurt you. When they hurt you, respond like Christ. When they mocked him and said, well, why don't you just get off the cross yourself? He could have. The one person in history that had the power to get down off the cross of his own will didn't. You see, that's what it means to carry your cross and to be like Christ. It's not to be a helpless victim. He wasn't helpless. But he was willing to be a victim. To be like Christ is to be crucified unjustly. And to have the ability to get down. And to have the ability to take revenge. And instead, willingly choosing to remain the victim. Willingly choosing the cross. Instead of getting down of your cross... Instead of taking revenge, you pray for those who are crucifying you. And that's what it means to be Christ-like. If we want to see the world changed, we start with that part of the world that you have the most ability to change. And that's your own heart. That's your own thoughts. That's your own emotions and your own attitudes. Realize that the other person's sins may just be forgiven because he sees your faith. That other person and their emotional problems and their physical problems may be healed when God sees your faith. And that's the most difficult part. When you come to realize that the other person that you're mad at, the one that you're mad at over there, the one person you know that has sinned against you, the one that is being mean to you, and maybe you know they are like they're like that towards you because God hasn't seen your faith. That's really hard to, to sit with. So the next time somebody sinned against you personally, the next time somebody wrongs you personally, that's a good time for you to take a look at Christ and say, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Please help this other person. Please love them. You take these people to Christ. If we would start having that sort of emotion towards people, I believe a lot of healing would spread throughout our entire church, our entire nation, and in, in, in the entire world. And glory be to God forever. Amen.